In late 2001, Indian intelligence agencies put the Indian branch of Huawei Technologies, a Chinese telecommunications company, on a watch list. Huawei India was accused of supplying technology to the state's enemies in Afghanistan, Iraq and Pakistan. Worst of all these charges, that they were doing business with the Taliban. The already damaging allegations were made much worse by their timing. The EE Times first published the story on December 12th, three months and one day after the attacks on the Twin Towers in New York. Of course, it's never a good look to be seen aiding terrorists, but if you had to pick the worst times in history to try it, late 2001 would probably make the top of the list. Three days after the story broke, Indian authorities announced they could not find any evidence of Huawei business dealings with the Taliban. The company requested that the U.S. government clear its name, as it was believed that U.S. officials were the ones responsible for tipping off Indian intelligence. The Americans offered no apology, nor would they corroborate Huawei's innocence. In that story, the U.S. comes off looking really bad, with no proof they supplied a story that hurt Huawei's international reputation. Many times in the years since, especially more recently, in 2018 and 2019, the same pattern has occurred. Western governments have Huawei of everything from IP theft to financial fraud to cyber spying. Often, these claims are made either with no evidence or only circumstantial evidence. Sometimes, though, there is real hard evidence to suggest that Huawei may not, in fact, be the victim in this story. They have a long history of doing shady business, which makes them an easy target. In fact, they have committed a number of illegal acts, the kind more fitting of a criminal organization than a legitimate tech company. Hi, welcome to Malicious Life in collaboration with Cyber Reason. I'm Ran Levy. Even if you don't know much about Huawei, you may have heard of their recent ban in the US. It's been in the news a while now. On May 15th of last year, Donald Trump signed an, quote, executive order on securing the information and communication technology and services supply chain, which dictated that the U.S. Department of Commerce could regulate the import and use of communications technologies from a, quote-unquote, foreign adversary. In layman's terms, Trump signed a bill that allowed the government to ban Huawei from the entire country. American companies now have to apply for express permission to use Huawei tech within U.S. borders. Sometimes, when headlines about this stuff come up on your newsfeed, it's difficult to tell what to think. Are they really a national security threat? Or are they a political scapegoat? I wish I could tell you now, but it's really very complicated. I'll need a couple of episodes to explain why. Think of of Huawei sort of like a company like Cisco here in the U.S., but a company that that makes uh, more consumer products. This is Amit Serpil, VP of Security Strategy at CyberReason. So they do have... The, the telco grade equipment, the big core network switches and, and, and huge routers and stuff that, that Cisco makes, but they also make a lot of stuff for the consumer market. So they make um, Android cell phones, um, they make all sorts of, of, of gadgets, they make um, robots that clean your house, sort of like a cheaper version of Roomba. So they're a very big company that makes a lot of things. Huawei is a massive company, one of China's biggest. They do business in over 170 countries and employ nearly 200,000 people. 
According to Forbes, they are valued at $8 billion, placing them among the 100 most valuable companies in the world. Their size alone makes them a target in international business and politics. Western countries, not just the United States, have been keeping an eye on them for years now. But the bad press has increased significantly in the last two years, not by any coincidence. Huawei is the world's foremost provider of telecommunications equipment. And telecommunications equipment is really, really important right now. 5G technology is coming, and it will require a massive worldwide investment in infrastructure. Most countries will, in the coming years, contract telecoms equipment manufacturers to build out new 5G networks. For companies like Huawei, this is an opportunity for mind-boggling profits. But there's a second benefit, too, for whichever company gets the contracts. Whoever provides all this equipment also gets to control it. In short, Huawei wants to be the company you use to communicate with others. You better make sure, then, that they're not abusing that privilege. In 2012, an 11-month-long investigation by the U.S. House of Representatives Intelligence Committee found a worrying trend. A number of American companies using Huawei equipment had witnessed, quote, unexpected behavior. Most notably, routers were apparently funneling large amounts of data to China at late hours of the night. That's pretty scary stuff, right? Late in the night, mysterious attackers siphoning who knows what. The House Committee advised that all American companies block any deals with Huawei going forward. But few actually heeded that warning, perhaps because those claims of unexpected behavior lacked substance. The public version of the report cited no direct evidence to back up the claims. Since 2001, and even today, this kind of soft evidence, claims, observations, theories, and suspicions, has dominated the discussion over whether they should be banned or not. It has led to real-life policy and business decisions. Hard evidence is much more difficult to come by, in large part because of the secrecy of the parties involved. Governments are secretive. Intelligence work is secretive. And Huawei can't just release their source code to the wider public for scrutiny, or else their products would be easily replicated. As a result, very few people actually know what's actually going on under the hood in Huawei equipment. Very few, but not no one. Unlike the rest of us, there is one group of people outside China who theoretically know what goes on inside Huawei. They work out of the UK, and their reason for existing has everything to do with Huawei's history there. Huawei opened its England headquarters in the pretty town of Reading in 2001, but attention really ramped up in 2005 when they made a deal with British Telecom, the country's largest telco, to supply routers, transmission and other access equipment for BT's £10 billion upgrade of their networks. BT was under no obligation to preemptively inform the government of their Huawei partnership. Once the deal was made public, some officials worried. A report to Parliament by the UK's Intelligence and Security Committee summed up the problem by writing, quote, The government is therefore sometimes put in the position of trying to shut the stable door after the horse has bolted, end quote. The proverbial horse had long since bolted. Huawei transmission equipment would now be installed throughout Britain. Over the following five years, according to officials briefed by British intelligence, a strange pattern began to emerge. It was a problem with Huawei's core switches, which control the flow of data. Some technicians had noticed the switching doing a lot of, quote, 
chattering. To whom, or for what reason, was unclear. Hey, Malicious Life listeners, I'd like to invite you to listen to a very interesting episode of a new cybersecurity podcast called CP Radio, also produced by us here at PI Media. Do you know Fortnite? If you've got kids, there's a good chance you do. It's one of the world's most popular games. So popular, in fact, that a black market economy has developed around its in-game currency. Each episode of CP Radio focuses on a new research recently published by Checkpoint and dives deep into both the research process and its implications. In this specific episode, I'm talking with Oded Vanunu, one of Checkpoint's top researchers, about an amazing hack he and his colleagues in Checkpoint's research lab uncovered that allowed cyber criminals to take over game accounts and sell virtual currency to For real life dollars and cents so check out CP radio search for CP radio in your favorite podcast app or point your browser to research.checkpoint.com you might notice what BT staff recognized in their equipment sounds remarkably similar to what was reported to the US Intelligence Committee the following year in the US it was unexpected behavior from routers in the UK chattering from core switches there was still no smoking gun or anything close to it On the other hand, these conclusions were drawn by two entirely different entities, a whole ocean apart, within a couple of years of each other, so the coincidence is notable. If pressure kept mounting over Huawei's business in the UK, they risked being expelled entirely. At the same time, expelling Huawei would be expensive and risked alienating the Chinese. So, as a compromise, British government intelligence partnered with Huawei to create the Huawei Cyber Security Evaluation Center, also known as the Cell. The job of the Cell was to vet, quote, every piece of Huawei hardware or software destined for the UK market, end quote. They'd be overseen by the GCHQ, Britain's NSA. You wouldn't think that a critical GCHQ-sponsored cybersecurity center would be found in an ordinary business lot next door to a real estate company, a couple financial services companies, and a police software vendor. Their building is short, nondescript, made of brick and tinted windows. Most of the place is a parking lot. The bushes out back are neatly trimmed and a little yellow bin out back that looks like it's made of plastic. Really, the only sign that this place is of any importance is that unlike the next door building, this one has security cameras covering the perimeter. Plus the top sign hung up out front, which reads Huawei Cyber Security Evaluation Center. The sign, in a way, is emblematic of a bigger problem. In 2013, Britain's Intelligence and Security Commission questioned whether the cell could, in fact, carry out its stated goal. You see, while GCHQ oversaw the organization, its members, in large part, were Huawei personnel. A clear conflict of interest. As a result, in 2014, a further oversight board was created, staffed by representatives of Britain's largest telcos. It didn't solve everything. For example, cell staff were still largely Huawei employees. When the managing director is being paid by the company they're supposed to be policing, that's a problem. In recent years, the cell has released negative reports accusing Huawei of having vulnerabilities in their equipment and failing to adequately address them in reasonable time. 
but the specific findings aren't disclosed to the public. In fact, just about everything about the cell, besides the big sign out front with the name on it, is kept in isolation. For an ordinary government agency, the secrecy is normal. But the cell was supposed to bring transparency to Huawei. Instead, at the cost of some bad press every year, they have allowed Huawei to continue the business in the UK without much scrutiny. The result of their work is that we, the public, don't really know any more than we did 10 years ago. It's why, for this episode of Malicious Life, we'd needed to hear from someone who'd give it to us straight. Yeah, so when my uh, previous uh, work before Cyber Reason, I, uh, I was an exploit developer and um, a vulnerability researcher, and among the things that I did, I, uh, I, I reverse engineered a lot of um, IoT fir- firmware and a lot of um, routers and, and, and modems and a lot of, of things, mostly on the uh, consumer side. Not as much as the telco grade stuff, but more and more on the consumer side. So home routers, modems, a lot of CPE, customer premises equipment. And a lot of the stuff that I took apart back in the day was made by Huawei. Few people outside China and Banbury, England, can claim to know much about the inner workings of Huawei's business. But on the scale, Amit Serpil is closer than most to at least knowing a little. In some of those products, I did find things that look like backdoors. So... Um, for example, look at take your like home router, for example. In order to go into the configuration of your home router, you usually need to log in into the web administration panel and provide a user and a password. And what you get is um, pretty much a web interface that allows you to do whatever it is the manufacturer wanted you to do. So you can't run and execute arbitrary commands on the router. You are sort of... Um, restricted and limited to whatever it is that the web interface uh, allows you to do. In one of the products that I reverse engineered, um, I found that there is a really, really, really long URL. So you would go in your browser and you type in the IP address of your router and then append a slash to it and then add a really, really, really long URL to it, something that had, if I recall correctly, like uh, 256 characters of something that looks like a hash, and that will drop you in this like sort of god mode interface that allows you to basically get a get a web shell on the device and run any command that you want. Log into the administration panel um, without any credentials. Pretty much, it's it's you're dropping into a god mode on 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 that device. So that was uh, only one example to one of the things that I found back in the day. Just about any way you look at it, Amit found backdoors in Huawei Tech. That's big news. Episode over, right? Well, there's a caveat. Not all backdoors are created equal. Some are the result of simple programming errors. Some are purposefully built in to make the job of maintenance easier for service providers. Only a tiny, tiny percentage of the backdoors out in the world today are designed for malicious reasons. A lot of of Chinese products, uh, either made by Huawei or by other companies, have backdoors in them. Uh, a lot of researchers, uh, myself included, took apart firmwares uh, of various uh, products came out of China, and uh, we often found backdoors in them. Now, th- those backdoors could have been some very stealthy stuff that were left in, in the product without the intention of it being found, but a lot of it was also um, the product of... Uh, shoddy QA, stuff that that made it into production uh, without anybody meaning it to make it into production. So with Chinese products, you often found a lot of really weird and obscure interfaces that bypass all sorts of authentication mechanisms and access controls. And it's basically like a skeleton key that gives you access to everything in the product. 
You mentioned that there are real serious clear back doors, but then also in your past work, there are certain features of Huawei tech and maybe Chinese tech in general that uh, amounts to maybe a backdoor or something else like that, but wasn't necessarily designed like that, if I'm correct in my interpretation of what you said. How do we square these two things, right? On one hand, we say, you know, any backdoor is immediately a big problem and we should really address it. But if all Chinese tech is like this, then are they purposeful? How do we tell where intention begins and ends? So let me give you an example. I remember reverse engineering a lot of products and a lot of those products had those administrative accounts that were not listed in the manual or in the web UI or anywhere else. But only if you took the firmware apart and started to look at um, the accounts on the system itself. So most of these products are basically, think of them as like resource deprived Linux machines. At the end of the day, what's, what's powering those machine those machines is, is, is Linux. So if you, um, if you look at the file system of the firm, firmware and you look at the accounts and you look at the config files and everything that's on the firmware that's not accessible to you, the user, you can find a lot of things. And in many cases, I want to say almost in any case, I found uh, backdoor accounts that were probably a part of some sort of testing in the factory, but they forgot to remove them and they shipped them to production. So, for example, you'll have, uh, in many cases, I found devices that had, like, the, the username was manufacturer and the password was manufacturer but flipped. And that will give you, like, administrative access to, to everything. Now, I don't believe that those things were meant to be uh, super stealthy backdoors. I believe that they're the practice of, of shoddy uh, development and, and, and QA practice but they were indeed shipped into production. So um, if you know that you now have large quantity and, or a massive quantity of devices uh, located in all sorts of places around the world, and all of them have those accounts that will give you this sort of God mode access. So aren't those uh, unintentional backdoors as serious as the intentional backdoors? It's sort of a philosophical question. Amit has enough experience reverse engineering Huawei equipment to know it contains backdoors. He's also got enough experience reverse engineering other companies' equipment to know that they too often contain backdoors. Are there more backdoors or more obvious backdoors in Huawei's tech? Maybe. But that conclusion isn't all that interesting. What we really want to know, ultimately, is not whether there are vulnerabilities, but why they're there. Are the backdoors simple coding mistakes, oversights in the production line, or intentional design elements to allow for Chinese state spying? For years now, Huawei has made real measurable decisions towards trying to convince people that their tech isn't malicious. For example, after a 2018 study concluded that their tech had big technical and supply chain vulnerabilities, the company pledged that they'd spend $2 billion over five years to fix those problems. A year later, Huawei's chairman told reporters that they would be willing to sign a no-spy agreement with the UK government. Such a policy would be difficult to enforce, but, you know, it was a nice gesture. Representatives from Huawei and the Chinese government have argued that any villainization of Huawei has more to do with media hype and scoring political points than actual cybersecurity. That the US, in particular, has targeted Huawei more aggressively in recent years certainly fits with some of the current administration's other policies towards China, including criticizing their currency manipulation and instigating the so-called trade war. These kinds of stories suggest that Huawei may just be the unfortunate victim of petty international politics. However, 
A closer look at the company's history suggests that maybe they aren't innocent victims. That cyber espionage wouldn't be so far off from some of the other questionable, immoral, criminal things they've already done. In our next episode, we'll expand on Huawei's questionable history, as well as on its complicated relationship with the Chinese government, who, as we have already seen in previous episodes of Malicious Life, has a tradition of using local tech companies, such as Baidu, Google's Chinese equivalent, for its own goals. Lastly, we'll try to answer the question, is there anything we, in the Western world, can do to tackle those creeping suspicions? All this and more, next time on Malicious Life. That's it. Thanks for listening. We had two Twitter polls in the past week. In one, following the Toe Talk miniseries, we asked you how widespread do you think is the surveillance of civilians through mobile platforms across the world? The poll's result were overwhelmingly one-sided. About 92% of you think that, yes, surveillance of civilians through mobile platforms is widespread and growing. Listener Revolutions Per Minute added that this also affects businesses because, quote, businesses buy consumer mobile devices and don't use software policies to lock them down. So productivity is affected due to background spying, end quote. Is there anything to be done about this trend? Listener Footprint underscore Zero wrote, quote, The only way to stay protected from surveillance is to not have a smart device. Don't connect to the Internet and don't be around people connecting to the Internet. COVID-19 has proven that the Internet is a utility, not a luxury. How can one avoid surveillance? You can't, end quote. On a lighter note, in a different thread, following our Max Headroom episode, I asked you, what is your favorite tech-themed TV show? Max Headroom was certainly one of my favorites when I was growing up, as well as MacGyver. I'm a bit ashamed to reveal that at some point I even had a MacGyver haircut. But keep it between us, people. Nobody needs to know. V to the K wrote, quote, Mr. Robot and IT Crowd, if it counts. The original, not the shitty and forgotten about American remake, end quote. Well, I haven't seen the American version, so I can't comment on that. Matt Thornton, who lives in Guernsey, which is an island in the English Channel off the coast of Normandy, how cool is that? Suggested halt and catch fire. Mr. Fresh, who is a spacecraft system engineer at NASA and a musician, I mean, really, can you be more cool than that? Responded with, quote, Mr. Robot, and you can't live out the $6 million man for us 70s kids, end quote. To which Matt replied with, if you're going there, that opens up a ton of opportunity. I'll just leave Knight Rider and Airwolf here, end quote. Steve Austin Knight Rider and Airwolf. These were TV shows I grew up on. Such sweet memories. At Shishkatanga 1 added Ghost in the Shell, another classic. And listener Freudian Faceplant from somewhere in Canberra wrote, quote, Black Mirror is hard to go past, showing the potential unintended consequences of technological concepts is quite chilling, end quote. Jack Resider from Darknet Diaries wrote, Surprise nobody said CSI Cyber or You've Got Mail. End quote. Two shows I never got to watch, sadly. And listener WT added two more that I didn't know about. Quote, two British classics, Gadget Show and Gadget Man. I do like Mr. Robot, Black Mirror, and Ghost in the Shell, too. End quote. I personally stopped watching television a few years ago, but now that we're all isolated at our homes, maybe it's a good opportunity to binge on these oldies 
but goodies. Thanks to all of you who replied to our questions on Twitter. For more interesting discussions and polls, follow at Malicious Life or at Ran Levy. That's R-A-N-L-E-V-I. You can also mail me your feedback and ideas for future episodes to ran at ranlevy.com. Our website is malicious.life, where you'll find all of our previous episodes and full transcripts. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. Thanks again to Cyber Reason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye. Oh my God. CK Music, Music, Music.